Welcome to another episode of the High Existence Podcast. This episode is the second of our HEX or High Existence Dialogues. This is where me, John Brooks, Eric Brown, and Mike Slavin, the three High Existence team members, come together and have a, a free, expressive conversation about a particular theme or topic or something that's just going on in the world right now. In the first of these dialogues, we just discussed the situation with coronavirus and how we can maintain sovereignty in such a trying time, how we can find the middle way in the midst of a global pandemic. So go back and listen to that if you haven't already. In today's episode, we talk about the mythological significance of global catastrophes. We discuss things like cultivating sovereignty in uncertain times, slippery slope of framing humanity as a virus as some people are doing currently with memes the danger of listening to successful people and following their advice what nobility looks like and why it's so underrated and why we need to get it back we also look at how the hero's journey relates to global events the revitalization of the warrior archetype how to be more of the hero the world needs and much much more if you like these dialogues then please leave a review let us know what you think and share them with your friends it means so much to us we are going to be producing these quite quickly and consistently because we really want to connect with our listeners we have found this podcast to be an incredible way to communicate directly with our most loyal readers um so so yeah thank you for listening and uh, here's the second of the high existence dialogues. So, uh, hey, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most awkward social situation you've had recently? Huh? Awkward social situation I've had recently. can't think of one man I haven't really had many social situations lately I guess there's been you know at a distance with zoom calls and stuff but nothing too awkward the weird the weirdest one that I've had lately is um, my parents came home from Costa Rica right like two weeks into March and it was right after the time that the Canadian government shut down our borders and any of the Canadians coming back home had to voluntarily kind of self-isolate and quarantine themselves and so I went to pick them up from the airport but it was weird because it was just such a pattern interrupt where like I couldn't actually go give them a hug or anything like I couldn't like touch my parents after giving them and now we have to like eat separately from each other and can't interact too much and it's just a very strange occurrence to be living with people and not not able to fully properly interact with them at the level that you'd like Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a bummer you know what might be a lot worse than social distancing though social closeness you know if there was social what social uh, closeness so if there was some virus that uh, propagated when you were away from people so you had to be uh, really huddled up to other people all the time for it to stop spreading that would be intolerable leave it to John to bring in the negative visualization <laughs> that would be intolerable after a while all this is bringing to mind for me is the uh, those videos you get of the subways in China where people are like rammed on you're closer than shoulder to shoulder and you can't can't have any moving room you feel like sardines in a can Mm. You guys eat sardines? Uh, yeah. Yeah? I've never really got into them, but I have friends who are fans. It just seems, just never, never appealed to me. 
<laughs> Sal- salty fish, man. What's not to like? I, I don't know. That, I think Tim Ferriss had a wave of sparking that. He used really? To prom- he used to promote, uh, I think it was sardines, in one of his, I think it was a four-hour body, and people just started relentlessly buying them. And he recommended this one company, <laughs> and he has this term called the hug of death, where whenever he promotes a company, they go out of inventory almost immediately. And so mm. there was this little, like, natural food shop that produced sardines who kept getting out of stock notifications because people just bought them at such a, like, by cases and just drained them. Yeah, Tim should give them a heads up so not to, so they can prepare by, uh, <laughs> you know, buying some extra supply. It's a very strange, like, mimicry thing that we do where we, whenever we see someone that we idolize or someone in a position that we want, we think that the way to get there is just copy everything that they do now like where they're at in their current state and it's like well that's probably not true at all they had a whole different set of personalities and actions and steps they needed to take to become the person that they are so you need to focus on that not not the manifestations of what they're doing now and yet that's all we do and that's the power of influencers it's like oh yeah i eat this kind of food right now it's like okay if i suddenly go and eat that i'm going to become exactly like them it's like there's a deep flaw in that argument you ever think about how uh people who are successful then tell their stories about how they reached success but no one ever asks like it's like there there isn't the the piece brought in related to how our gifts are so close to us that sometimes we can hardly see them. And so as someone's retelling their story, they might miss really key important pieces that are the actual were the pieces that made them successful that they don't share because it comes so naturally to them. It's just been edited out of the story. And so a lot of this advice from successful people um, could be utterly flawed advice because it's missing key pieces um, that actually got them there. And not to mention the sort of retroactive storytelling of like, yeah, then I did this and then I realized a lot of times people revise and edit uh, in a way that kind of deviates from from what they where they actually were in the moment of making choices and stuff like that. So a lot of advice is just, is not, you know, yeah, I don't know. A lot of advice could be could be discarded if it isn't super universally applicable. You know, like a body, of, like a philosophy or something. Um, some people are just like, here, just replicate my life path. It's like, no, you don't want to fucking do that. You're a different person with different skill sets uh, inside of a different context at a different time. Why would you try and do the same thing that person did thirty years ago? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and we actually put a piece out about this on High Existence, but there are a number, particularly people like the kind of peak performance crew, where you'll hear interviews with them and it's like, yeah, I actually like hated myself for a long time. I viewed myself as like incomplete and not good enough. And that is what sparked the fire that fueled a lot of my thing. And, you know, people kind of shrug that off, but it's like, is that really what you want? You want to go through decades of like self-loathing to get there like there might be a better way to think about this it's so easily just overlooked it's like yeah well i want to get there but it's like yeah but what if 20 years of your life are spent in deep suffering like come on guys yeah and and then the story of success is actually a signaling mechanism to bolster their continued and prevailing feelings of unworthiness it's like that never going away and they never resolved it. They just achieved success and they're continuing to scraping and reaching for success. And that's, it's like the narrative, the advice is actually their own way of bolstering and inflating uh, a fundamental sense of inferiority. This is getting, this is like going down interesting, interesting places. I don't have like, you know, anything against people who give advice. I think there is some really good advice out there, but there's also people who like follow it single-mindedly and don't understand that their life is different than the person that they're listening to you know it's like you've got your own thing going on you have to make choices based on your circumstances and really trust that wisdom cultivate your own authority 
like slay the guru you know what i mean <laughs> in in the book happy by darren brown the british psychological illusionist he wrote a book happy uh, which is like mostly stoicism but it's just a sort of a good self-improvement slash philosophy book and he in the book tells the two part formula for success it's like it's really deep genius formula if you wish to achieve success in a particular field it is a combination he says of talent plus hard work <laughs> that's it like <laughs> right that's all he gives it's like yeah you know if you if you want to be successful you need some talent you know you need to be like pretty good at it at the thing you're doing and you need to put in some time um and that's really what it comes down to and anything beyond that is pretty much luck um and yeah i wrote an article that kind of went into this on high existence and i i critiqued arnold schwarzenegger's six rules for life i just brought it up so six rules for for like success um in life number one trust yourself number two break some rules number three don't be afraid to fail number four ignore the naysayers number five work like hell number six give something back it's like at what point in in those six rules for success does it say have the world's greatest bodybuilding genetics like <laughs> you know like it's kind of an important rule if you're talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger's success <laughs> And, uh, totally. That that's yeah. that's the ex that exactly hits home the point I was making just a few minutes before. Of like how people they're so close to their own gifts that they don't mm. they don't see it, don't take that into account, and usually will just credit like their own agency or the choices that they made leading them there. Hmm. Yeah, and a good reframe that Darren. Darren gives is that whenever someone gives like say rules for success that are you know somewhat vague you know this is different from like a kind of a, a psychological deep breakdown that's kind of evidence-based you know like something you might you might see from um, like a nutrition advice you know but so sort of like generic rules for success he says that they could also be rules for failure because there are so many people who followed those rules and failed maybe much more than succeeded so um it's again it's like what framing are you looking at these rules from <laughs> it's kind of interesting it's called survivorship bias or something like that i think mm -hmm. um yeah the the success cases are made very salient because we see because they have the you know the status symbols the mimetic like pieces that we want to oh gravitate towards and all the others fade into the background and it's like yeah how many people followed that advice and went off a cliff another thing that was interesting about that uh, piece around uh, don't be afraid to fail it's like I don't maybe maybe not, maybe you should be afraid to fail you know maybe maybe it's like more maybe a better thing would be it's okay to feel afraid in the face of failure just don't let that stop you from taking action because um, if you're not afraid of failing it might maybe you're not you know risking enough or you're not really leaning in to what you really want if that if that fear isn't present there's there's this way it really bothers me some of spiritual and and self-help community that have a way of uh, kind of ostracizing what are typically considered negative emotions you know like fear or sadness and it's like you gotta remain positive and it's like not always not always positivity is just one part of the the spectrum of experience and it's so contextual like emotions are contextual if you have if you feel sad because you just lost someone good that means you're not a psychopath or something like that you know it's it's like trying to recode these real natural emotional responses because we read a book that tells us Oh, we need to maintain our vibe, keep our vibe high, positive thoughts, positive thoughts. I mean, 
that stuff just feels maddening to me and not a good prescription for a life well lived from my perspective. Yeah, a big thing I think that gets missed here is nothing that's not useful stands the test of time. Like if it's if it's not effective, it dies off and is lost to history. Right? So if there is something that has withstood the test of time, it's there for a reason. Like if you had if you had certain emotions that were not useful or adaptive in some way, they would go away. It doesn't just stick around wasting energy for kicks. And so, yeah, you take that back and you run it against like, oh, okay, so what? You mean there's a place for anger and a place for grief and, and envy and jealousy? And then you get into some really interesting territory there because, yes, they served a purpose for you and they continue to or they wouldn't be here. Totally. I was I was having a conversation with a friend about this, the emotion of anger. And uh, it, the the, com the the topic came up like well what is the point of feeling angry you know is there actually a point to feeling angry and actually as someone who's learned some martial arts I will tell you that I really do not want to fight someone who's crazy drunk and angry even if they have no training There's something that's very off-putting about that to me someone who's sort of unstable and and I could see that being a very useful trait if one wanted to acquire status or intimidate others back in sort of primal days to be able to tap into the wild character persona yeah there mm, there's really interesting stuff coming up from from both of you um the one thing i'll say is that i think you're right eric about things that are here have a function and I'd also caution people in that uh, there are ways in which we can miscalculate what the function is and believe oh this is the function when really it's something else entirely because you could this this could get us get me into trouble for you know people who are staunchly religious I don't know how many listeners would be staunchly religious but if you are that's totally cool um, but just consider uh, mechanisms built into Christianity that force its propagation. A lot of people like to say, oh, if it wasn't true, it wouldn't be, have stuck around for so long. That's not true. Things can stick around for a long time because they have me mechanisms that propagate, meaning they, they, for whatever, it's, there's something in the structure of the thing that keeps it moving forward, like the fear of eternal damnation. So I'm going to share this so I can avoid burning for eternity. That, that's a huge motivation underlying a lot of people's, uh, you know, proselytizing. So, so there's that, like that's the function. And it, like that's a big part of, not to say there isn't any truth or goodness or beauty in Christian faith. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is there's a momentum to it that's baked into, into it that it's like, that's based on um, in fear in a lot of ways to continue its propagation. Like the thing wants to survive, lives in, in human hosts. It, it offers this new kind of perspective on things like meme plexes. It's, there's these idea landscapes that, you know, live within people. Do people have ideas or do ideas have people? That, that old like quote, <laughs> that's something to think about, you know? Um, and from what you were saying, John, um, I lost what I was going to respond to there. I, don't, I, I got so fired up on the, on the Christian front. Hopefully this doesn't sound like too uh, heretical, but it's, it's worth considering, man. I, I'm, I'm with you there, although I, I suppose you could argue, I still, you could still follow Eric's line of argumentation that, that, um, that it's still it's still definitely possible perhaps even likely that a self-propagating sort of religion would also die out eventually if the ideas in it weren't useful if they didn't have some inherent usefulness like just uh, like yes. so self-propagating without use would eventually die out self-propagating with usefulness you've got a really good recipe for something that lasts a long time. I would agree with that. 
and it and it's yeah i would just say i would agree with that <laughs> <laughs> well this is like this is like the argument it's almost the argument against atheism right eventually you find yourself in a spot of being strictly atheist and all religion is useless right there's no value it should it should be burned down like whatever it's a detriment to society and it's like well really like humans throughout time have always faced a bunch of perennial problems right things that every human who is aware of its existence comes up against like connection to self connection to other connection to bigger story right eventually you always come under the weight of those questions and yeah there are many ways to answer that but they need answers right or you get crippling anxiety and kill yourself off basically and religion religion at large whatever instantiation of it it is provides frameworks that help answer those and address those problems they give you solutions they give you connection to self other and society and through that through the coordination of people and to Mike's point yes it can actually be a, a coordination of people through fear which you know for better or worse might not be the best might not be the best frame to do it but because it does that it continues itself rather than just you know not answering those and all the people who believe that eventually just knock off they don't continue because they haven't coordinated and survived the eons of difficult history that humans actually went through so there is there there's almost a yeah there's an evolutionary adaptive argument to the value of religious orientation at large or you could you know you can make the same case around a spiritual orientation if the if the wording is getting tricky for you but it's the same fundamental principle absolutely and i don't mean to assert that the only reason christianity is around is because of that those mechanisms of propagation although it certainly contributes to it and i think there is an interesting question that might uh, expose some rich territory are, are like what are the things that we've lost that were supremely useful that didn't have the immune system or the defenses to withstand other th other things with sort of stronger momentum uh, behind them that could kind of sweep the, the, the rug out from under the other sorts of dispositions and belief systems. You guys ever consider that? Like, as we march towards progress, mm -hmm. this arc of history, what are the jewels and the gems that get left behind that we aren't even aware that we lost until it, we're so far past it that it's like it's a, a compromise we didn't even realize we made? I have an obvious one, straight off, straight off, um, and it, this might sound strange now, with the because it's had a resurgence. But Stoic philosophy was almost completely forgotten for a long time, and uh, a lot of Christianity was adapted from Stoicism, from Stoic thought. But yeah, it was sort of uh, Christianity came along and knocked Stoicism aside, and Stoicism was just sort of like this obscure, interesting. It'd be like reading. Arthur Schopenhauer now it's like this you know that there's this wise philosopher that you could read and you probably learn something but like nobody does you know stoicism was that for like many centuries and only recently has it been you know the wisdom's been coming back and it's like, incredibly useful um for now and for all times um but yeah there are lots of psycho technologies like that that to just get like I don't even know what other ones there are that we don't know about right now but uh, yeah, another one would be like shamanism. I don't know if that was necessarily like forgotten or just sort of obscure, but um, yeah, I mean like that could have easily been kept to the people who who kind of had, had these practices and not shared with the rest of the world. And now it seems to be going in the direction that like shamanistic practices and plant medicine healing could be the most psychologically beneficial sort of healing tool like that we've ever discovered like we still need to study but get more data but it's definitely possible that in 20 years this could revolutionize the way we do mental health work with people yeah i would actually even jump that up and just say philosophy at large has mm. been largely moved away from 
probably to our detriment. Um, and you know, we also fail to realize that there, you know, we we view science and the Western medical system as resolving a bunch of things that we used to suffer from, but we've also introduced things that we never used to suffer from, namely like widespread major depression and anxiety. Ancient cultures actually had really effective tools to deal with that. One of them just simply being community and people taking care of you and not being overwhelmed. But also to your point, to your point on shamanism, like actually very, very strong and potent tools to recalibrate and align yourself with with yourself, with your society and with the greater story that you're a part of. But two big ones that jumped immediately to my mind when Mike posed that question was the rite of passage, the rite of passage from childhood to a uh, mature adult seems to have been completely lost in modern society. You know, you have maybe the last surviving instance in the bar mitzvah in Jewish culture, but even that feels very for show. And again, we have a lot of people complaining these days about like grown up children, right? Where are the real adults? And it's like, well, we actually had a tool for that. We actually had a tool for people to become mature adults, namely the rite of passage, whether it's a vision quest or it's a deep psychedelic experience, because it served it served two functions. One was that the individual felt like a whole new page had been turned and that they actually stepped into maturity. But for those who came back from that, their culture also treated them differently, treated them like an adult and a member of society. And that's that's been a big one that's been lost. And the second is like the council of elders, like elder wisdom. Right now, you know, you work for four decades, you retire, and then you dip. Like, it's actually like a goal just to leave society as far away as you can. You either go to the forest or you go to somewhere nice on a beach and you just peace out. But the the elder councils and elder wisdom was so fundamentally valuable because A, they're beyond having kids right they've already propagated so there's no skin in the game there all they're really focused on is basically passing on knowledge assuring the continuance of society and i think again a lot of the things that are playing out here is like well people have already gone through this they already have the answers but they're no longer even participating in society and culture anymore and so we have a bunch of young inexperienced people trying to figure this out but they have no they have no guides they have no no wisdom to to learn from because you know we used to be able to rely on the experience of people who had already done this and that too it seems to have been lost to like i don't know the movement from community to individualism the movement from spirituality to science like there there's a bunch but those two things i think have been huge losses and that we don't even appreciate yet how big of a hit those losses are mm. these are great I, ha I have a few that I'll, I'll dish out I first want to say um, to kind of connect some of pieces that both of you were sharing there is I think there's a real reason that we've drifted from philosophy and that's because philosophy as it is today seems to be a lot of um, hair splitting and kind of circle jerking in the upper realms of abstraction in which it never actually like lands down into practicality where your average person can make use of such hair splitting and that's why stoicism is popular is because it's actually built for practicality and and people use it and it helps them in their day-to-day -day life that is you know the really uh, hard to decipher papers about some like finer points. I mean, there might be room for that in the academy, but a lot of that stuff, just your average person is just falls asleep, you know? So I don't, I'm not, you know, well, well read enough about history to know if, you know, how long philosophy, that word has been that sort of thing and how long it's actually been modes of like a an actual operating system for your life a, a way to live by uh, John you might have better better insight into that but that's certainly why I feel like people drift from 
philosophy in a lot of ways. It's just it's just too it's just too far from from their their daily life. And certainly, people who have strong cognitive capacities enjoy it, but it's it's like a playground for their their strong minds uh, rather than something that is going to be deeply impactful for the for the world around them because it's so indecipherable for most people. But anyway, man, I feel like I'm I'm uh, attacking Christianity and philosophy and this is uh, getting into dangerous territory here. There are no but, sacred cows here. Yeah. <laughs> so the uh, the thing that I will say that one of the things that feels like we've lost one is we used to have our needs used to get met on a very relational basis. If you can imagine during tribal times, our connections, our relationships were, were really supportive of generating our, our continued existence because, you know, this person would go out and hunt and this person was foraging and this person was creating the fire, building shelter, all of these things. It was a co collective action and your role kind of and endowed you with all the other pieces. And now we live in a society, we have this incredible invention, money, that has done a lot, has, has you know, created a lot of tremendous magic. There's also a lot of things that it, it kind of desecrated, which was that relational, you know, kind of bonding mode that would provide uh, the resources. And I think now we've seen this transposition onto the lack of resources. People feel the same kind of anxiety that they would feel around tribal exile. Um, it's like a, a, you know, huge, it's like if I, if I run out of money, I no longer have access to the things that will meet my needs and that would have been akin to tribal exile in the past and that has to be some deep deep seated fear um so there's so there's that piece that feels like we've we've lost this more communal relationship and now everyone's sort of holed up in their houses with their own little pile of tickets that they, they can go and use at the store to get from the person whose name they don't know and all of that kind of stuff so not like money, not to say we shouldn't have money or that I know a better way, but I think part of what this conversation is illuminating is there are things that are really, you know, widespread and useful, but that usefulness can also come at the cost of other things that were supremely useful that we didn't realize we were paying for at the time. Um, I had another good one, but I, I lost sight of it. So, so that is, that's that. Another one that came up for me is, um, this, this, um, we've kind of lost the, the ability to be physically dangerous. Um, you know, if, if you think about like we, we, and I don't mean to other human beings necessarily. I mean, we, we, we were evolved hunters and gatherers and protectors of our of our tribe and it, by dangerous i don't mean like aggressive or, or mean or nasty but simply the idea to be able to take a spear and throw it with precision uh, you know like the, the olympic games for example kind of like show show like like that we have within us this like athlete this inner athlete this 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 um this version of ourselves that can throw a javelin or or um like a rock um, can can run can can hunt can can take down in, in a team uh, like some sort of mammoth you know that this kind of like physical hunter archetype and many of us in today's society you know we just sit at a laptop with terrible posture all day every day barely get our heart rate up barely take any steps and we wonder why we're miserable and we have to prescribe ourselves like medications like maybe because you're not the animal that you're meant to be you know maybe it's just literally that simple it's like <laughs> you are designed to be a very deadly impressive athlete like that's your baseline you shouldn't even maybe look at athletes as these like strange mystical beings over there 
Like, that should be perhaps the norm. Maybe you should be able to run for three miles easily at any point right now. You know, and I think we've kind of like lost that. But I am seeing like a trend of people becoming more fit. You know, people like Joe Rogan and podcasts kind of like showing people that, yeah, you know, like exercise is super healthy. This has been going on for like about five to ten years. So it is changing. But the older generation haven't quite tuned into this um, as much as the millennials that I'm seeing. What are your thoughts on that? To me, what came up while you were sharing that is what we've lost there is we've lost embodied experience, period. We've moved almost entirely from our bodies up into the abstract realm of our heads and we're just entirely disconnected because you could easily bucket in emotions in there too. Mm -hmm. We've lost a lot of feeling, right? This is the widespread like depression nihilism movement where it's just I've lost connection to feeling. I'm very numb. I don't feel very much at all, right? I can't perform because I don't even associate with my body very much, right? It's actually like a... Um, mental illness like disassociation like you literally are just not there at all and you know what what that was bringing up is immediately it brought up the warrior archetype right very i think this is exactly what you were saying and i feel like it stems from this misunderstanding that the warrior can only exist in a battlefield and because we don't go and fight with spears and shields and swords anymore that there's no role for the warrior anymore but honestly that couldn't be further from the truth because the the warrior was also a set of characteristics right it was clarity of focus it was discipline it was confidence and strength of character and even you know you look through those lists and like that's a lot of what we've lost too right you have a very kind of effeminate male population now very weak and to your point like you're you're not a you're not a strong animal anymore and no more than ever particularly as things get bumpier and bumpier like you need you need those characteristics embodied again you need to come back into it and you know this is rising up for your people and your culture like in a world that's in flux and in some ways crumbling down you would actually need warriors more and sure, you can have warriors in the schools, warriors in the workforce, but you still need that sense of discipline and clarity and strength of character. And those things all live in the domain of the embodied warrior. I love that. Yeah, the, the word that comes to mind is wild. You know, we're, we're civilized. That's another thing. Civilized, what's that mean? And there are a lot of really good things that, like I'm very grateful that where I live, people aren't killing each other on the streets, at least with any degree of regularity. Um, and, and not like it used to be. <laughs> because, <laughs> like I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that civilization has offered that. But to your point, John, the, the, the danger uh, the ability to be dangerous or to enact that the the wild man or woman, I think it connects back to the piece you you were kind of churning inside of related to anger before, and it's part of like we're so disconnected from our anger. Mo many people are that they, when they feel angry, they don't know what they don't even know how to use it, and so they end up acting in ways that are. Um, not generative or don't support uh, whatever, like their relationships or whatever they're trying to do. Um, it's like, so that creates this whole sort of dynamic where you have an outburst and then you feel bad about it. And then you, it creates more, further compression or you don't you don't share your angle anger again and then you have another outburst and all these kinds of things and what people really need to learn is how to use their anger to defend the things that they care about but from a place where they're grounded and they understand the externalities of their rage that like that is the 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 mode i read this paper not too long ago it was it was something like it was called like catharsis and other heresies and is basically making the point that emotions have these, you know, there's ways of completing emotions where there's a physiological 
thing that happens where the emotion is is completed. And a lot of people think, well, with anger, I just need to scream into a pillow, and or you know, punch a pillow, or go outside and yell. And you might need to do that in order to just feel like it's okay to be angry. Like just know that you have that muscle, but. Continuously doing that is probably not the best choice because all of the research shows that that's only going to increase the likelihood that you get triggered more easily or ticked off more easily in the future. It actually promotes and propagates more future anger experiences because people start to get addicted to the high they feel when they let that surge of anger rush through them. And that can wreak havoc on, on, on their relationships. So what this person suggests is the actual completion for anger is to speak firmly about what it, what it is that has you upset towards the person who's done it. And they, they'll notice that there's like an offloading of heat, like the body releases heat in the process of doing that. Um, and so over time, you know, if you've, if you've, never spoken up for yourself, then you have all of these injustices that compile. And then when you decide to speak up for yourself, it comes out like a, you know, a bat out of hell. Um, what is that saying from a bat out of hell? I've never used that saying in my life. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I thought it was from a song. Uh, it's like an Ozzy Osbourne. I don't know. Uh, but if you maintain over time an ability to speak firmly, and in your relationships, you have the trust that you can speak firmly and people will hear. Like, this is what we mean by boundary setting, right? Like that is enacting a boundary in a way where you're, you're like clarifying and pointing out, hey, this upset me and I'm going to speak to it. And, and that resolves the anger because the part of us that gets angry is the part that feels like an injustice has occurred. And David White has this beautiful piece around anger in the book Consolations in which he's talking about how all anger emerges from this deep well of care that overwhelms us and and um, and then we don't know how to respond or act and so there's there's this piece to recognize that anger you know in in a combat situation or something you feel this rage because you're wanting to protect something and so it's with that, if you feel really comfortable with your anger, there's still the discipline that you're mentioning, Eric, that is actually the honorable warrior and not the tyrant or the mad king. And so it's integrating these pieces. And then so that's, yeah, that's what's flowing through me related to that. I'm wondering how that connects for you guys. Yeah, I had, a, I had a quick thing come up there. This is what Jordan Peterson talks about when he goes off about virtue and being a virtuous person. Virtue is like something acted. It's like an active, it's an active process. It's not like the absence of something. So if you're weak and sick and incapable, you're not virtuous because you didn't kill someone because you couldn't. You literally don't have that option. You're not capable of doing that. But if you're strong and a badass and know how to wield a weapon and you choose not to, Right, exercise that power that you have. That is when the virtue comes through, right? And that is that is also goes right hand in hand with the discipline and the the strength of character because it's like, damn, I could do this, but I'm actively choosing not to. It's just it's not it's not that there's an absence of my ability to, and that somehow makes me virtuous by default. It's no, I could do this, and I'm choosing not to. I'm making the active decision to avoid it. Yeah, I like uh, I like Jordan Peterson. Um, if you haven't listened to the biblical lectures, they're on YouTube for free. Really, really highly recommend those. Um, but yeah, he talks about he breaks down the saying, "The meek shall inherit the earth." You know, and it's like how often that's misinterpreted as like the word "meek" to us now means you know, sort of like cowering in the corner. <laughs> you know, it's like mm-hmm. like hiding away from life, but. Um, the word meek in, in was closer to the in the original translation as as someone like a shepherd. Shepherds are talked a lot about in the Bible, um, but again, shepherds now are different from shepherds then. So, like one crucial difference between a shepherd you might find now and a shepherd you would have found in the time of the stories in the Bible was that shepherds had to fight away lions 
who are hunting for their sheep <laughs> you know so like that that's kind of a big difference from like you know just someone who kind of brings sheep together um a shepherd back then was someone who on a daily basis had to scare away lions um who were, who were, who were coming to eat his his animals so so yeah the the idea the meek shall inherit the, the earth is better translated as um, people who have weapons but do not use them for evil shall inherit the earth that is a closer translation Mm -hmm. I love it yeah there's a a call yeah that no, like nobility and honor arise uh, when I hear you guys discussing this which aren't er, they're, they're not words that I hear very often in discourse or they don't seem to be values that are elevated, which is interesting in and of itself. I'm not quite sure why that is, but it seems associated to this the sense of virtue and right action. Well, and this is this has been a hobby horse of mine for a little bit, and these things are. These things are all tying together. But again, like nobility and honor and virtue are adult characteristics because they know better, they have the experience and they have the power and capacity to actually do otherwise. Right? Kids are kids are innocent, right? They that that level of care and judgment isn't expected from them. And I think the problem that we're running into here is our whole lives are framed as like be the hero and go on your hero's journey and life is life is the hero's journey and it's actually like the hero's journey is like the archetype of a child it's a child they undergo this epic quest and they come back home at the end of it a mature responsible adult able to then slip into one of the modern mature archetypes of an adult but and again the rite of passage was the thing that was the journey that they would go on to come back but now we have, you know, that that thing never happens at all, right? So we just have ch children aging, but embodying all the same things as children, right? They're naive, they don't understand, they don't have the power to do anything. And so, yes, then there are all these fundamental, what, personality traits or virtues that never get embodied because there is no mature adult population to actually embody them because we've never done the process of becoming that thing. And this is, this is a huge flaw because, you know, what happens when you have a society and culture that is decided on and enacted by children embodying childish virtues and characteristics? Like, it's really bad when a whole culture doesn't have nobility, doesn't have honor, right? Doesn't have sacred trust. And we see it playing out a lot now. Right? You sacrifice, you know, sacrificing people for profit, right? Making short term decisions for quick gain over long term investments in, in future and people and planet. And it's like, th the stuff doesn't come out of nowhere. <laughs> like, there's a reason this stuff is playing out. And it's because a lot of these fundamental, I don't know, human processes just have been entirely pushed off to the side. Yeah, and that. That connects to the piece about elders that you brought up before. Mm -hmm. You know, there is certainly room for more role models. And there are people out there who are embodying these traits and are people to look up to and, and people to uh, learn and grow from. But I think the point you're making, Eric, is there's far too few of them. You know, we should have a lot more. I mean, there are a lot of pockets on the Internet that feel a lot like a classroom before the teacher walks in where everybody's just talking and like over over one another and it's just blah, 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 and nobody can hear anything everybody's just talking about and you know what I mean mm -hmm. um, and that it's like yeah in this modern climate where everyone has a social media account and they they're using their voice but are they fully accounting for the importance of, of the voice that they're bringing and are they 
where are they speaking from? Are they speaking to elevate themselves, to appear cool to their friends? Or are they speaking to try to extend betterment to their, their surroundings? Are they trying to be a force that helps raise the boats? Um, and not, not from a virtue signaling place, but from a genuine, like, I've considered the facts. I have a sense of where things are going. This is what I believe is important to know and important to act on now. And, uh, yeah, everyone who I, in my life, who I've seen display those characteristics, I feel so, so grateful for them. It's just incredible. And I can only hope to continue to cultivate myself such that I can be that for other people. Um, and I feel like life has, in its own way, forced me through my own, you know, rites of passages. And there have been a number of them. Um, that's another thing is the... I, I wonder if a rite of passage emerged as a, like, as a practice, as a ritual, after they realized when life kind of swept in and brought the great storm or, or the warring tribe or whatever, and they realized and noticed how that shaped the tribe thereafter, like the younger people, how that matured them, that they realized, ah, we need to put them through, let's create a simulated event that will have the same kind of effect and really cause them to let go of childish tendencies and be, begin to step into their maturity. I imagine that's how it, it may have transpired. And so there's still rites of passages that people are getting exposed to losing a parent or having a breakup or having to travel across the country or what, you know, whatever they, psychedelic experiences. They're still out there, but they aren't cult culturally instituted in a way that is, you know, on en masse, large scale, building adults. There's a huge lack of adults in this world. Yeah, um, on the topic of rites of passage, I think that there's real evolutionary utility in seeing tribe members under pressure and seeing how they respond. And that, that means utility for yourself and utility for them. Because, you know, when we see ourselves cope with pressure, we can't help but just sort of level up our own identity. Um, and, you know, we could easily take like someone like a religious person who appears to be saintly and they appear to be kind and benevolent and you put them in a burning bus that's when you're going to see how benevolent they are when they have the choice to save some kids or not and it's that pressure that really shows character in a way that sort of a life without pressure doesn't so a rites of past rites of passage can show you know, this is the person that I'm going to have by my side for the next, like, couple of decades. I want them. To, I want to know that they can hold their stuff together when, when things get tough. Similar thing with the, the seals, you know, like buds going through mm -hmm. a grueling hell week. Um, it's really just to see how do you cope under pressure. I think that's, like, the whole purpose of buds. Can you cope under pressure? Um David Goggins talks about that in his book Can't Hurt Me, Jocko Willink went through it um, yeah the military have kept some of these these sort of old ways of doing things um, such as the, like the rites of passage the, of course they're, they're warriors right? so they've kept a lot of the warrior archetype um, elements um, but yeah I, I, I was thinking about um nobility as well Mike I like that you brought that up and uh, I had a strange thought like what what is it that makes someone noble and what what is it that makes someone not want to be noble I think because that's like that's a really good question like why would someone not want to be noble and it came to me this uh, this idea that nobility because we're you know with this coronavirus pandemic going on right now nobility is not buying more toilet roll than you need. That is a good analogy for that. So why are people not noble? And why are people not practicing integrity? Because they see other people aren't either. 
-hmm. to be noble and to stand strong you have to walk a path alone you have to be like ned stark in game of thrones you have to tell the truth when you are facing great odds you have to be the person who goes to the supermarket and doesn't buy more than they need even though you have the voice of fear saying well maybe you'll be hungry you do the right thing anyway um so it's one of those it's one of those strange things that in a world where, where people aren't noble as default it is very difficult to be even though that might be like a deep desire because of course all of our favorite characters in movies have integrity they are heroic they do the right thing they tell the truth that appeals to us you know we love the avengers we love tony stark we know that he has a heart and he's going to do the right thing so it's definitely mm. something that speaks to us but but we don't do it yeah that's that's bringing up something really interesting because there's this it's like that capacity that capacity to resist the temptation and the seduction of just lining up in order of where the social waves are pushing you you know there's so much in us as social creatures that just ha has us wanting to do what we see everyone else doing uh, even if there's a part of us that senses this might not be right but there there's just this propulsion and so connecting this to rite of passage um, this might not be exactly a rite of passage but it's certainly a, a key moment uh, in a key step towards maturity and that is the the ability to act in a way that is completely at odds with the social rewards so to to be someone who can make a choice independent of how the people around them are are going to to handle that choice if they if it feels like the right thing and it doesn't mean you know you do it nobly you do it you, you make the choice with honor but there's it's like the sacred no i think is what nietzsche said i forget which part was it the tiger or the camel or what it was but it's it's related to that it's like you it kind of eject yourself momentarily or create a degree of distance from what used to be sort of the mesh where like a, a you're just kind of like embedded in this social system and to be able to exert your will to see i have a choice here i do not have to just go you know just be swept up in this wave you know like nazi germany so many good you know, well-intentioned people got swept up in the wave because their neighbors are neighbors are doing it, and if it builds up incrementally, um, that's what happens. So there's something about cultivating that capacity to say no in the face of overwhelming social pressure, no matter the cost, that allows someone to redeem their soul in a way that is, and this is connected to what we talked about, John, on the last last group podcast you were speaking of stoicism and how like whatever the only bad thing that could happen is losing your character something along those lines and so i think when you when you really feel in touch with your own inner nobility or a reverence for your ability to make right action that becomes something so valuable and so worth defending that losing that or taking the social rewards actually isn't a valuable trade-off anymore it's like i don't I, it's like being sold a lie. It's buying into something that looks nice on the surface, but underneath is empty or hollow. It, it, it's, but it's compelling to certain parts of us. So, so yeah, really getting in touch with our ability to make the choices that make a difference for us and for the world around us, to really feel that, and know that we have that within us, that I, it feels like it can begin to create this feedback loop where we start to gain this confidence of our ability to make choices that are in alignment with our values. And, and that's when you start to feel this sense of 
momentum building in, in life where it doesn't matter what's going to happen. I know that I can trust myself to respond in the ways that are right. And I'll, I'll leave it there for now. I almost went on this whole tangent about spiritual philosophy that tries to eradicate the difference of right and wrong and how I feel like that's super misguided. But, uh, but I, you know, I've just been talking a lot, so I'll pass the baton. Well, this is actually a perfect example. We were talking earlier of like what's been lost and, you know, you, you take a word like noble, acting nobly, nobility, and it's like, well, A, you can't, you can't act something out that you don't even have a definition for, A, and on a collective level and an individual one, none of us have a working definition of that. And I would actually argue that for many of us, the only time you ever even heard that word was in like early grade school when you did medieval history and you learned of the nobility class, like the king and the queen. Like, do people even know that that could be considered a virtue? Like it's something that can be acted rather than a class designation and a title that could be given to you. It's like that is how far disconnected we are from this space. Like just the the fact that it doesn't even come up anymore. It's not even a point of discussion. It's not even something we have a working definition of. And again, you'll you'll be walking around in the dark. Like if you're trying to enact something that you don't even know, that you don't even have traits for, that you don't even have examples of. And the biggest, I had like a visual metaphor coming up uh, while you guys were sharing of just like lifting the tide back up or like lifting the, yeah, lifting the common lineup. Because a lot of this stuff, right, you guys are describing like the tragedy of the commons, particularly with the toilet paper thing. We have a common resource that we all need. It'd be good if we all had access to it. But if you're going to take some, and I know that I also need some, well, I'm going to take some. And then because that other person sees both of us taking it, they're going to think the same thing and they're going to take it. And suddenly you get in a panic hype and it's all gone. A, <laughs> a noble person would come in and be like, no, I'm not going to participate in the race to the bottom here. A race to zero. I'm actually going to, through my actions, demonstrate the thing that would lift this back up. And I'll take what I need and I'll share it and I'll tell others that I have a resource that they could use if they're in need and they didn't get any. It's actually this counterbalancing force that lifts the momentum back in a positive direction rather than just joining the stupid race down to the bottom and to, yeah, getting rid of the resource entirely. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think about this meme that's going around right now? that coronavirus is healing the world in some way due to the world slowing down and you know like the canals in venice are clearer than they've ever been the smog around china is clearing up um nasa satellite pictures are showing that you know pollution is sort of disappearing a bit like, what are your thoughts on that meme do you think it's true harmful useful um spooky like what are your thoughts on that i think it it would be a bit of a misnomer to say that it's healing the world um i that that doesn't feel like it fully fits for me but it does feel like it's creating a moment for reflection if we can see tangibly natural beauty that has slipped away from us based on the systems that, that have emerged around us that can provide a, a bit of a, a spark or motivation for trying to better steward or take care of that. But the, the, the thing is, a lot of of people are quarantined, self-isolating. Uh, so a lot of this stuff is stalling out, but that can't be maintain maintained forever. Like you're, you're going to see people run to their limits of isolation until um, it starts becoming like a mental health issue. 
And so what, if someone's saying that, oh yeah, the virus is healing the world, look at these things that are happening, what do they think is going to happen when, not that we're going to return to normalcy, but when a lot of these lockdowns are lifted and people start living as they have been, at least to some degree, going out in the world, you know, traveling, we're, we're surely going to see a lot of reductions in things, but yeah, I just don't, I don't understand where the, like, that's, this is not some permanent change. This is a consequence of the ratcheting back of all of this human activity, which could be, could create a really beautiful moment for reflection that I do agree with, but I don't see this as being something that um, is permanent without deeper structural changes. Could this inspire those structural changes? Sure. Um, but it's, I don't even think it's clear to everyone, to anyone, really, what those structural changes would need to look like. Um, it's, it's a very difficult nut to crack. But, um, yeah, so that's, there's so much more I could say about it, but I'll leave that uh, as my response and give the floor to Eric. I think it's extremely dangerous, actually, because there's a historical precedent for this. And so what I mean by this is the the sentence that commonly follows that meme when it gets shared on social is, you know, coronavirus is healing the planet and humanity is the virus, right? That That is the second part that gets added on. And that is extremely, extremely dangerous um, for two things. One, it, it sets, sets a belief that we as humanity would be unable to attain that level of symbiosis with nature <laughs> like just period that we're entirely incapable of doing that and it sets this like limiting belief period and it's like well that's actually not true sure there'd be radical change necessary but we can definitely get to that point if that is something that we truly want and this might actually be a catalyst for making us want that more um, the second is the planet was not sick like the planet is more resilient than anything and it's existed in countless different forms throughout all of time right it's been covered in ice before was it sick then it's been covered in water before was it wounded then like no it's just a different form it's almost self-aggrandizing humanity's impact overall like the world's gonna be fine it's humanity that actually needs to be concerned about where we're at and if we want a future here and what we want our future to look like but the reason i say was it, it is extremely dangerous is in the wording of humanity as a virus and i feel like we always come back to this example but it's extremely important which is nazi germany wasn't created out of hate it was created out of order and cleanliness and you can actually read a book that's like tableside conversations with Hitler and it's just random shit he said during dinner time and all of his wording was um, you know these races as viruses and bacteria and they're infecting our culture and through that like the first thing he did when he got into power was he did massive cleanups he was like he was almost OCD with how clean he wanted everything and like Zyklon B, like the gas that they used in gas chambers, they originally just used to clean out factories of like mice and rats and stuff. And then it just escalated into things that needed to be cleaned up. And so you can weaponize humanity as a virus like unbelievably quickly because you can already see it in some circles, right? Like, okay, if humanity is a virus, like, we need to kill it, right? And what do we need to kill? Oh, we need to kill capitalism. So we need to kill all the financial dudes who have been fucking up the stock market for so long. And then again, immediately you have class warfare, you have prejudice, you have more hate, and it's, it is an extremely slippery slope to go down. And yeah, I'm very wary of it. Yeah, I think you, you're, bringing up a good point there, Eric, and how it kind of imbues a person with inevitably a sense of self-hatred. Um, yeah. And that, it's like we, we also have to understand that the world that we're living in is due to natural processes. That's the thing, there's this disconnect that's made where human beings are seen as outside of nature 
but this is the world that we're living in is has emerged through like this is how civilizations develop and we've developed these technologies and there's this whole cascade that has us here and not to and that isn't to say that here is right or wrong there's a lot that is is beautiful like breakthroughs we'll be able to save tremendous lives and and develop technologies that improve quality of life and all those and there's a lot of terrible things about the way that the world works number of homeless people people can't afford health insurance who end up going bankrupt i mean you you know the list like there's there's all there's lists on both sides of things that are tremendously like great gifts of current systems and uh you know, great tragedies and so it's like the recognition that this is like the metaphor of just like a mindless kill machine or a cancer it just it's this is one of those narratives that could flower during this time that would be counterproductive i think we need to like a good question to ask is what are the narratives that can emerge that are will actually be supportive in creating that better world and certainly conflating humanity with a virus doesn't feel like one of those it feels like it will again imbue that sense of self-hatred that self-hatred will get projected outwards onto other people and just the slippery slope as you say eric will will progress towards violence um and and so what is what is a more galvanizing narrative that as realist realistically assesses the damage that we're doing that doesn't lock humanity into a um like a pathological kill machine metaphor you know there's there is tremendous beauty in humanity and in civilization we can't lose sight of that mm-hmm. that has to be integrated in any narrative that is to uh persevere through whatever is to come john where do you sit with that um I didn't see it as being as dangerous as you put it, but Eric, but when you laid it out, the, the, the points like that, I definitely can see it like that now. That's, and that's, I think why it is dangerous is because it is, as you said, a slippery slope. You can, you can see it as just like a silly little idea, like, oh yeah, humanity's a virus. But actually that, if that takes hold, then uh, that could be like really, really bad for, for like on a mass level. Um, so forgetting the humanity is a virus part, just the idea that slowing everything down, slowing down like the production of everything, everyone pausing globally. And as a result, it's Earth sort of, you know, the man-made issues such as like pollution, air pollution from factories and things like that, um, have have slowed down. I think that, I mean, it's hard not to make meaning from it. You know, it's hard not to go mm-hmm. like, hmm, hang on a second. Um, there's this huge wake up call that we're experiencing now. We are not as invincible as we thought we were, you know. You know, we nature can easily come along and literally in the space of five minutes send the entire globe into a state of panic. <laughs> like, if if you look at how small a virus is, it's like so small and in an instant, a virus that jumped from an animal to a human did what's going on right now. Um, and that's, that's staggering, you know, like a, a virus doesn't need to be able to speak 20 languages and invent an, uh, like an atomic bomb. It doesn't need to do that to put everyone on hold. So that's kind of humbling, actually, that nature is mm-hmm. immensely powerful and that we're not as invincible and as godlike as we think we are or thought we were. And that many people have said that we could have been preparing for this better and we didn't. You know, cause many of us have the whole like, oh yeah, we'll figure it out when it comes. And a lot of people had that attitude actually in the early 
few weeks of this whole situation. Oh, it's going to be like the others. You know, nobody remembers swine flu now. Remember that thing that happened a few years ago? Yeah, nobody, <laughs> nobody worries about that now. They'll deal with it over there in that country that isn't us. And here I am in the in the Welsh valleys, and hearing about people getting infected with this virus that a few weeks ago, a few months ago, was in Wuhan in China. You know, it's kind of how does that happen? Like that's how interconnected we are. <laughs> like that's that's pretty staggering. Um, but yeah, I think that I think that it's it's just how can you not make meaning from it? That you know, some some we can't keep going the way we we've been going and expect that we're not going to go through a crisis like this again or much worse to me that's just like the obvious message that i'm that i'm hearing um so so yeah it's it's humbling and a lot of people are saying this thing like doesn't it feel like we're in a movie you know, if you've, you've heard people say that, wow, it feels like we're in a movie. Well, at what period in history didn't it feel like a movie? <laughs> you know, like, did you ever see World War II? Like, people lived through that yeah. not so long ago. <laughs> right? Like, you know, human history is full of these crazy things. I mean, why would our life be any different? I mean, this is life. And yes, it's... <laughs> It is crazy, but yeah. What are you going to say, Mike? Uh, so. Movies are derivative of life. Mm. You know, not the other way around. People forget that. It's the same with heroes and stories. It's like life has that quality to it built in. And then we've made stories about it and got so used to reading the stories that we've forgotten that where it came from. You know, like on the on the feet on the ground kind of level so yeah I mean there is something kind of cinematic about it and I, I've wondered how this whole thing has been transformed or mutated due to uh, the living in an era of pervasive communica communication and participatory media where now people have a voice and they can share, they can boost signal or boost noise. And it just changes the entire landscape of how, how we relate to something like this. Because we can have like up to the minute IV drip of, of what's happening, you know. And in the past, that wasn't the case. Think about 1918, Spanish flu pandemic. Well, people listening to the radio you know, here and there getting an update or reading the newspaper once daily, if that. The, the velocity of the information um, is much higher. And I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just saying it's, it's interesting. It's novel. And it affords difficulties in parsing, like what can I trust? And it also creates uh, challenges in, and really, you know, in making sense of the world, but there's also this whole possibility space that's open up due to it. Coordination that can happen at a distance that you just wouldn't be able to do in, in any other media environment than this one we're in today. And that's, there is some promise to that. And I'm, I'm really excited to see as the stories emerge of the people who took decisive action and didn't wait for somebody to say, hey, you need to do this. They just went and did it because they knew it was important. And I know there, there's a tremendous amount of those kinds of things happening. But as I was talking, I remembered the thing that I forgot earlier. That's one of the things you lose. Uh, and it was the shift from broadcast media to this more participatory, decentralized kind of communication that we have with the internet. And there's a lot of issues with broadcast media in that it, the message can be so tightly controlled and there's no influence from the general populace. But what it did provide was a degree of social cohesion that we have just simply lost. And you can feel that cohesion now with the, the virus. It's like everyone is thinking about the same subject. And that hasn't happened in a long, long time. I mean, it happened for a little while 
with 9-11 here in the States. And, you know, I, I'm not sure how much that was a big deal in other countries. It probably hit their radar, but probably didn't linger as long. Um, but before there was this social cohesion that emerged from just everyone was getting the same stream of information, more or less. You know, early days of television, you have five, six TV channels and you can go and see your neighbor and say, how about that thing? And understand. But now there's been this fracturing that's happened with the Internet uh, that has really eroded a lot of that. And I, I worry that it makes it more difficult for us to have conversations with people and connect because the information landscape we're all dealing with is uh, is unique and, and algorithmic. So, so yeah, that's just recognizing that that thing is something that we've lost. So how is it we can create social cohesion in an age of distributed participatory media where you choose what you want to kind of get served up? How do we do that outside of a global, you know, catastrophe or crisis? And so I want, I just wonder how this is going to galvanize people and, and how long we will feel the sense of same pageness. And when I say same pageness, I don't mean everyone agrees with the threat, but it's what everyone's talking about, you know, on a massive, massive scale. So that's just some interesting pieces to to consider. Well, and before we jumped on this call, Mike, you also had a really interesting frame that I loved, which was it feels like we've been collectively thrust into a psychedelic experience, right? The classic kind of etymology of the word being soul revealing or mind manifesting and it's really it is this hard mirror of us taking a look at ourselves even the sense of like time slowing down right things becoming a little surreal you're a little more dialed into the things going on around you you're more sensitive it's like it, it actually hits all the classic hallmarks and it and like like many of these experiences it has the potential to take a bunch of paths you might have moments of fear you might have moments of awe and wonder and reverence maybe a maybe in a uh, m waves of gratitude right for the th <laughs> the way things were how simple life was before this and all the all the innocent moments of just walking out and seeing your friends that you didn't take in as deeply as you could have so there will there can be i'll say that there can be a huge kind of post-traumatic growth that comes from this at the end right if you can integrate the lessons that came up if you can really embody the lessons that you're being shown here it has great potential in the end absolutely and you know every this is inconvenient for a lot of people a lot of people had plans that they were going that they were really looking forward to and this is even more than inconvenient for a lot of people. It's life or death. And, and so we've all been thrust into this thing and we're all, we're all kind of on the boat together. All of our, it's so magnified how our choices cascade and ripple and affect people right now because it could literally be contagious and they could ca like contract something that could kill them. And, I think it's really worthwhile to consider how you're always contagious with something and it might not be a biological virus or, or a strain of bacteria, but the way that you show up in the world really matters. And right now, you might not be contagious with COVID-19, but you might be contagious with fear or you might be contagious with denial and what it's like we when we really recognize that there are these cascade effects what can we what is it we we want to embody you know bringing it back to nobility how would someone with nobility act and respond in these situations to the best of their ability but to more to your point eric about some of the possibilities that are that are going to be opening up you're going to see people who really struggle with a job loss but they're going to pivot and find something that feels more aligned with what they want to be doing and they're going to gain confidence seeing how they can traverse a patch like that. Now, there's 
like humans are incredibly adaptable and it's unfortunate that the education system sort of squashes one's desire to learn but one of the things that we're, we're co cooking up here at high existence is a course on accelerated learning a a short sort of couple day experience where you're going to be able to understand sort of the meta principles that lead to accelerated learning and as we were talking about it we realized this is something that people need to know because the world is not going to slow down like we're going to continue to see these rapid changes over these next months and years how do i maintain adaptability how do i learn the things i need in order to continue to get resources gain fulfillment all of those kinds of things so that's that's on the horizon still it's still in the process of of being prepared but we're very excited about that and, and creating that, that space for people to begin to really reclaim the satisfaction that comes with learning and upgrading um, and having, having like the right map to apply that to really any domain. So more on that on the horizon, but this we're, we're entering a time of great reflection and tremendous possibility as well as uh, a, a deep trough of grief. I think that's on the horizon as well. So having the ability to grieve, having the ability to learn and adapt quickly, and having the ability to sit with yourself in silence. These are all things that are, we're, we're all sort of thrust into a context in which these are really relevant skills right now. So in the last call we had Eric you were saying that you had some you you had some optimism about the good that would come out of of this difficult situation and i actually don't think people can comprehend how much personal gain they might get mm -hmm. from from this situation as it is always the case with challenges you look back and you're like wow i'm so glad that that happened um while you're going through it of course it's you, you really you really wish things would be different but a, a small example is something that happened with me today is uh about a year ago i bought these mats because i wanted to create a home gym you know i have a spare room i wanted to create a home gym about a year ago i bought these mats and i never put them down like i put they were over my friend's house just like left there um but today, within the space of two days, um, I, I purchased a kettlebell, a pull-up bar. I got the mats back from my, my friend's house. My dad um, put up some sort of like punching bag on the wall. Within just a couple of days, me and my dad made a home gym in our spare room. And it's looking really good. And I feel really excited about it. And this home gym would never have been created if I wasn't gearing up for self-isolation. And this is a gym that I wanted in my house even when this pandemic wasn't happening. But, you know, stuff would happen, life would get in the way and junk would just clutter the room. And I think that's a really good analogy for what's to come in many areas, you know. When you're alone and you have more time, you have more focus and you can get, get on with stuff, what can you achieve? And that's also, as Mike was saying, that the purpose of this course that we're gonna be releasing soon um, how can you turn this time to your advantage, this time alone, this time of reflection? Um, I'm, I'm prepared for stuff that could, you know, be difficult, but I'm also, I'm definitely excited on a personal level um, about becoming stronger through this and getting things done that I've been putting off for a while. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm optimistic about that. And I, and I would encourage everyone who's listening as well to start thinking about, you know, what what can you do? What personal projects can you can you aim for? What things can you learn that you you've said you've always wanted to, but you never had the time? Yeah, and again, this is a this is a sign of maturity, is recognizing the thing that's happening and choosing to walk towards it power strength openness and yeah you know we're now at this point where if you're relatively locked down and you're taking care of yourself 
that's that's you've maxed out your civic duty like that's really all you need to do so now you're in this incubation period right you're sitting at home literally incubating like an egg like who is the person that can be birthed from this right this might be a couple of days this might be a couple of weeks like there's a massive potential sitting in front of all of this and yeah it's just what are you going to make of this opportunity right what frame are you going to choose how are you going to show up there's a lot to come and i think we'll be doing a few more of these as time stretches on and more ideas come up um i think that's getting to the time for us you guys want to wrap up with anything i would add that i think the civic the civic duty piece i think there is a great opportunity for people to rebuild their connections with their loved ones in this time um just checking in on people, seeing how they're doing. If you feel situated and comfortable and you've got added emotional bandwidth to reach out and see how people are doing, that can be a tremendous service in this time. And if you have particular skills that could be useful, one of the things that I've been seeing is people with 3D printers coming together to help print out uh, medical um, you know, valves and, and things of that nature that are on short supply and that can help contribute. A little, like there are things, Things like that that are worth considering, take an inventory of, um, and seeing how you could show up. But otherwise, if you don't have particular expertise in, in an area that really seems to be relevant, then cultivating your inner qualities so that you can be someone who shows up in the midst of this and really can be a stabilizing presence as we surf through these times of great change, um, that can make all the difference. Uh, a lot of this work, it doesn't necessarily have to be physical or tangible. There's a lot of emotional processing and healing that's going to need to happen. And uh, being someone who can lead in that way is is not uh, not something that uh, we want on short supply. So I've personally picked up a lot of things in this discussion that I'm going to be thinking about um, and I find that just talking in this way with you both in this sort of like safe container, not just to talk about my feelings, but just to talk about ideas, you know, like to clarify my own thoughts and hold space for you to clarify your thoughts is like really what we all need right now. So mm-hmm. um, I hope that this conversation for those listening ha- have ha- has helped you clarify some of your own thoughts and inspired you to, to carve out these spaces with your own friends and family if that if you find that that would help and uh yeah we'll we'll speak to you soon um we're gonna keep doing these and create some sort of discussion where we can interact with you more on the points raised in these talks in the in the near future Thank you for listening to High Existence Podcast. The fact that you listened to this all the way through is such a gift. Um, It means so much. If you could pass it on to a friend that you think might find it useful, that would also be amazing. If you want to leave a review or rating, that would also go a long way to to supporting the, the podcast and helping us continue to do these. So yeah, once again, thank you. And we will see you in the next episode.